Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, first and foremost, I want to take the time out to thank the brothers that invited me. Because it's very important that we thank the people. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam me mentioned if you do not thank the people, then you haven't thanked Allah. And on top of that, it's incumbent upon the Muslim that every time you have an opportunity to implement the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one should hasten to do so. You should hasten to do it. Because any act or statement that's in conformity with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu this is the most praiseworthy speech or action. Secondly, it's almost important, almost as important, is implementing the Sunnah, is showing gratitude also whenever the opportunity presents itself. Because many of us, we all have our trials, we have our tribulations. And many of us, when we in sujood, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify whatever these affairs may be. But a lot of times we become grossly negligent in acknowledging all of the other favors and bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon us prior to this affair that you're anticipating. So gratitude is also important to seize the opportunity to always show gratitude. It's gratifying and it's humbling. So I go by the name of Amir Junaid Muhaddith, formerly known as Loon from Bad Boy Records. Many of y'all may know me. Some of y'all may know me. Some of y'all might not know me at all. But the most important thing to understand is that I'm your brother in Islam. And it doesn't matter how we arrive, but it's from the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we sit in these gatherings in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu me mentioned that the malaika, when the believers sit in these type of settings, mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the malaika, they supplicate for us. So there's no better supplication than those who are the most obedient of all the creation is the angels. So when we get in these gatherings, it is also important to take in consideration the reward, the bounty, and the benefit that comes from gathering in circles where Allah's name is mentioned. So first and foremost, I like to establish why I'm such a stickler when it comes to thankfulness and gratitude. Because how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me to this religion. By show of hands real quick, how many of you brothers were born and raised Muslim? Allahu Akbar. And how many such as myself was guided to this blessed religion of Islam? Alhamdulillah. Something to always be grateful about. Because it doesn't matter how we got here, right? Whether you were born and raised Muslim, nurtured, cultivated and raised upon Islam, or you guided to Islam by way of darkness and ignorance. It's from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we sit amongst each other as brothers, believers in the law in the last day, believers in this message of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. I show of hands how many of you brothers were raised with both your parents. 
Alhamdulillah. How many were born with a single parent? Raised with a single parent? Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. May Allah reward your parents for playing a role of two parents. Alhamdulillah. And how many such as myself were born with or raised with no parents? So you see what we're getting. Because sometimes when we advise one another, it doesn't always, you know, it's not always received. But when it becomes tangible, like you can see now, by the raising of the hands, 96% of y'all, maybe 97% of y'all were born and raised Muslim. And the same percentage, if not more, you were raised with both of your parents. So when you see these things, it's easier for you to remember how blessed you are, how favored you are. Because myself, I was raised by my grandparents. I grew up in the streets in New York. My father, I met him at 33 years old. Wasn't a bad person, but he wasn't there. He made some bad choices. Spent a lot of time in prison. My mom as well. She was very active in the streets as well. And like many of her generation, they fell victim to drug abuse. And this was the reason why my grandmother took custody of me at three months old. And my grandparents raised me, and I was always grateful. Because it wasn't their job. It wasn't their obligation to raise me. And I treated them... As, as the way I would treat my parents, if not better. Also, where I came from was an environment that was plagued by drugs and violence and rape and murder and everything that you can think about that's in complete opposition of Islam. And just by looking at your eyes, the eyes tell a story. It's not an environment that any of y'all may be accustomed to, which is another reason why you should be grateful. Because growing up in this environment, many of the children, we grew up lacking all of the things that Allah favored you with from birth. And wallahi adheem, some of these children, out of sheer jealousy, will probably harm you for the things that you have. Out of sheer jealousy and envy. Some of y'all young kids like wiping your mother kisses off and stuff and pushing your dad back for being too loving and caring. And you have a child, numerous of them where I come from, that may look at you as someone who's extremely ungrateful. And this is why I'm so bent on being thankful and being grateful. So now when it comes to how I came to Islam, I had a very extensive, you know, career in the streets. I don't even know if you can call it a career. Because the things that I was exposed to and our options were very limited. We were either going to make it in sports and entertainment or we turned to the streets. Unlike your generation, y'all have a whole plethora of options and opportunities. Right at your fingertips. So the lifestyles that we chose were more circumstantial opposed to being choices. So when I find many of the Muslim youth today, I've traveled, I've been in the UK since the 14th. I've been giving these same tours and talks all throughout the US. Once I leave here, I'm scheduled to go to the Netherlands and so on and so forth. And when I see there's a commonality, there's a consistency with many of these communities losing their youth. Losing their youth to things that are in complete opposition to what they've been taught, what they've been raised upon, and what they've known their whole entire life. And whether it be curiosity or peer pressure that's leading you into experimenting with things that you was never taught by your parents, never exposed to in environments you were raised, and you're finding yourselves on a path of gradual destruction for no other reason other than your own choice. So myself, I'm very invested 
and doing whatever I can to try to combat that. And I can tell by many of the elders here, they're probably trying just as hard. And it's important for us as a community to rectify these matters and bring about good to the best of our ability, inshallah. So while I was in the streets growing up, that escape that I was looking for, I thought I found it in the music business. I had a very extensive career in the music business. I sold millions of records. I made a whole lot of money. I traveled the world. I had everything that people who don't have envy. And I thought that what I was doing was great compared to what I was dealing with prior to that. But as I continued to excel in that business, I started losing pieces of myself. The more and more I excelled, the more I started noticing things that were always more meaningful and dear to me gradually disappearing. And while everyone on the outside looking in were only increasing, and their attachment or inclination to what I was doing. While me on the inside, I was dying. I was dying. Because with fame and wealth, especially when it's achieved through these means, what happens is, You become subjected to people. The people that you're entertaining, you become subjected to them. Meaning you're there for their entertainment. And many of them feel entitled. Just because they bought one single record, they could just have their way with you. Like, you know, you have to sign this. You need to do this. You need to do that. And then secondly, the people who are intrigued by what you're doing, they subject themselves to you. So there's nothing organic and nothing real coming out of this is all about desires and at some point chasing your desires you're going to lose a lot of things that are way more praiseworthy <coughs> so at one point in my life I wanted to escape this reality so I set out to pursue my career on my own but what I had planned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had a better plan for me. I was traveling the world, doing the things that I do. No one ever talked to me about Islam. No one ever invited me to a conference where Islam was being taught. No one handed me a book or anything. And I lived amongst Muslims. I lived amongst Muslims. There's plenty of Muslims in New York. If you don't know, there's plenty of Muslims in America. And they lived in the same community I lived. But none of them ever extended the courtesy of even explaining what Islam was. This is why you have to understand when the Lord guides a soul from darkness, it should be a reminder for those of you who were born and raised with this bounty, who've been born and raised with this favor. When the Lord chooses an individual, Two things. Two things can easily be taken away. You could be reminded of all of the things that Allah blessed you with, or you could be fearful that Allah may have guided an individual for the purpose of replacing you, for being neglectful with your Islam. It's very important to understand that. That it could be a reminder, maybe that spark you needed, to start implementing your Islam. To start increasing in your Islam. Or it could be a reminder that Allah has guided another individual from darkness, from ignorance. Solely for the purpose of replacing someone who chooses to be negligent with the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on this journey, the first place I visited was a place called Senegal. A country called Senegal. Predominantly Muslim country. 
But I didn't go there for that. I went there to do the things that I was doing in my career. Unfortunately, you know, my culture has reached all four corners of the earth. I'm pretty sure they probably play hip-hop in Antarctica. I don't doubt it. But the reality of it is when I went to Senegal, did whatever show I had to do, party, whatever the case may be, I woke up the next day and I went to visit a place called Gory Island. Gory Island was the first slave house that's ever built in West Africa. So as an African-American, we always struggle with trying to hold on to our heritage, to our dignity by way of our legacy, and any attachment that we have to our ancestry. And very little understanding we have of that. But what we do understand, we hold on to dearly because we've been stripped of so much. But on this trip, something changed. I went to visit Gory Island. And instead of going with the tour guide that they had established, I didn't like this guy. He, he had on like a button-up shirt and a tie. He looked like he was taking you, like he was a valet uh, parker or something. He didn't look official. But by law, it was, a, it was an individual that was standing on the side. And my heart was inclined to him. I felt like he knew what I needed to know. And he took me on the tour after everybody walked away. It was just me and him. So long story short, he explained to me that 60 million slaves passed through here. He said, but 6 million never left the soil. They fought and they died. I was young and ignorant. So my response was ignorant. I said, man, they must have been some real killers. He said, nah, they were Muslim. I'm like, what you mean? He said, the six million that fought and died, they would not submit to no one other than the law. And they died upon that. And he said, the rest that were sold into slavery were the victims of what, you know, transpired with the strong who were broken down and killed for the sake of a law. That changed nationalism for me. It abruptly removed my strong grasp that I had on what I thought I had. Because now you're telling me all these years I've been watching people kill and be killed over the color of their skin. And you're telling me that these six million men and probably women as well chose to die for God? That was, that was, that was breathtaking for me. And I immediately abandoned black nationalism. My second trip, I visited a place called Kazakhstan. It's in Middle Eastern Asia. It's Russia. And in this experience, I experienced diversity. So I was a guest of the president of Kazakhstan. And like on the last leg of my tour... I remember being alone backstage, and he came in. You know, I'm young. I'm in my 20s. I'm getting a lot of money. I'm doing a lot of wrong stuff. And when he came in, I asked him a question. I was in the middle of indulging in something that I pray none of you ever indulge in. But I asked him a question. I said, yo, when you see somebody, like, in the street, how you say what's up? He says, Salaam Alaikum. I said, nah, that's what the Muslims say. He said, we Muslim. I'm like, wow. I grew up in New York. I only knew like three kinds of Muslims. I knew the Yemenis, right? They used to have the little corner grocery stores. I knew the Pakistanis. They had most of the pharmacies. And the West Africans, they owned all of the cab services. So that was my only depiction of the Muslims. I'm looking at this man, and he looks like Yao Ming. They, had, they look like descendants of Mongolians. He had, like, oriental features, Russian genetics. It was just, it was just strange to me. I was expecting him to say, like, Tonyo Tonyo song or something. He said, Salaam Alaikum. I said, well, that's what the Muslims say. And that impacted me. Because now I understood that Islam was diverse. And alhamdulillah... Me and the brother here were just talking. <clears throat> My final experience where Allah did something that words can't explain. 
I was in the UAE. Unfortunately, what we see, may Allah guide us and make us better, taking place there, you'd be lucky if you find any real remembrance of Islam. This is how I know Allah's guidance is real. Because I became Muslim in the very place that I'm talking about. A place where Islam is scarce. Even though the Muslims exist, even though Islam is practiced, but it's not something that's overly emphasized or broadcasted. So anyway, I performed in Dubai. And I remember later that night, we drove to Abu Dhabi. I was staying at the uh, Emirates Palace. At the time, it was the only seven-star hotel in the world. But with all of this competing going on in the Middle East, I'm pretty sure it's not, it's not the same. I don't think that's the, the spot no more. But anyway... <coughs> When I got to my room, I went to my balcony, and I looked off the balcony, and I saw the sun rising over the Arabian Sea. Now, in my line of work at the time, daytime meant sleep, nighttime meant party. I never paid attention to the sun. I never paid attention to the moon. This is another thing that you need to be grateful for. Because as Muslims, your whole life revolves around this. Your whole life revolves around this. Ramadan is near. You won't even know that Ramadan has started unless you gaze at the moon. In my life, nighttime meant party. That's it. Daytime meant sleep. So for the first time in a very long time, I was watching something that I took for granted for many years of my life. Something as simple as the sun rising over the Arabian Sea. And at that very moment, Allah changed my heart. Allah changed my heart. And still to this day, I've never been able to find words to describe what actually happens when the heart changes. I could tell you where I was, which direction I was facing, what I ate before that, but I would never be able to explain to you in detail what actually happens when the law changes a person's heart. Never be able to explain it. And if you come across someone who actually musters up words to describe that happening, I would not question his sincerity as a Muslim, but I would definitely question his story. Because nothing can explain when the act is done that can't be done by none of creation. We can inspire each other. We can motivate each other. But to change a person's heart completely in the opposite direction, there's no words that can explain that. And when that feeling overwhelmed me, I ran down to the lobby of the hotel. And the first Muslim I found, I asked him, how could I be Muslim? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want to be Muslim. He said, how, you, how do you learn about Islam? I said, oh, I want to be Muslim. I didn't want to talk. He was impeding the process, keep asking me questions. I believe he was just thrown off guard because you don't have anybody just run up to you randomly and ask you, about Islam, right? We normally try to call people to Islam. We normally try to invite people to Islam. I ran up on this man and I tried to hijack him for Islam. And once the smoke settled, he just told me it's simple. Do what I do. Take your right hand, put your right finger up, and repeat after me. And I repeated after him. Ashadu in la ilaha illallah. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And that was it. He told me, Alhamdulillah, you Muslim. I said, nah, man. That, that, that ain't nothing that simple. Ain't nothing in life that simple. Not the life I know. Not the life I was raised. Not the things I was exposed to. Everything was complicated. It was always hardship. It was always bloodshed. It was always something that was normalized in my community, even though it was wrong. And this man just told me that I had entered the fold of the only religion accepted on the Day of Judgment by just mentioning a testimony, two testimonies. I said, nah, man, it got to be more. He said, nah, alhamdulillah, you Muslim, Kalash, you Muslim. I said, you sure? He said, yeah, you're Muslim. I said, nah, man, that, that's not, come on, we got to go shopping and get the outfits or something. 
you know, we got to go over to the Arabian Sea. You got to put me in the water. Like, we, we got to do something else. It ain't that simple. He said, Alhamdulillah, you Muslim. I felt a weight removed, but I wasn't sure. So I called a friend of mine that I knew from Philadelphia. Brother I knew for a long time, but once again, may Allah forgive him, he didn't never invite me to Islam neither. He was known for doing something else. He was selling firearms. That's all I knew him for. So I called him. I said, Salaam Alaikum. He said, Waikum Salaam, who this? I said, this Loon. He said, yo, you Muslim? I said, yeah. He said, how you know? I said, what you mean? I just seen the man. He told me what to say. He told me I'm Muslim. He said, what he told you to say? I said, I don't know. I just repeated everything he said. He said, well, look, when you get back to America, man, you're going to take Shahada again. Salaam Alaikum. He hung up. I said, yo, this guy is crazy. I talk about like no compassion, no nothing. It's just like, <laughs> like you will come back and you gonna take shahada again. So I did. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> Came back, met with the brother, took shahada again. And just to add, when I moved to Egypt and I signed up for the Rasul Khas and uh, University of Lazar, they took me in a room. I went through some little vetting process, and they gave me a certificate that said I was a Muslim. So I took shahada like three times, right? So everybody that raised their hand said they was born Muslim. I'm probably more Muslim than all y'all because I took shahada three times in three different places, in three different countries. Allahu Akbar, right? But the reality of it is no one ever talked to me about this. I remember when I went back to New York for the first time and I went into one of the Yemeni corner stores. They seen me, had the beard, they seen this identity. He's looking at me. My brother, you Muslim? I said, yeah, salam alaikum. He said, what alaikum salam? I mean, he was excited. I'm looking at him. He hugging me. And well, I ain't going to lie to you. I had my hands to the side. I just kind of like, he just hugging and he just, I'm just looking like, and I pushed him back easily. I said, yo, why you never invited us to Islam? We stood in front of this store. I have friends that got shot in front of your store. Y'all actually let us bring illegal things into your store when the police was coming to save us. Just so we could continue to do business with you. Like, why didn't y'all do this? Like, you know, you could have saved all of us. We was out here lost, killing each other. Didn't know nothing. He was sad. He was very sad. So I'm sharing all this to let you know <coughs> that yes, we are human beings. We are human beings. But that doesn't justify anything when you're Muslim. Because when you're Muslim, you have more understanding of what it is to be a human being. So just an average human being has very limited understanding of what it is to be a human being. And most of their understanding comes from their whims and their desires. They're just freestyling through life. But as Muslims, we have the blueprint. We have a road map to follow. We have the best example that ever walked this planet. We have the most virtuous generations of Muslims that ever walked this planet. Male and female. No one is exempt from this understanding when we testify that none has the right to be worshipped with Allah. And that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah. We alleviate our excuses based upon that alone and then what we acquire from knowledge even decreases the amount of excuses that we may have as human beings so as your brother in Islam I just wanted to share this story with you so you to understand that Allah continues to guide people to Islam this is the fastest growing religion in the world and as Allah continues to bestow this mercy upon mankind, you must be mindful of the Islam that he gave you. You must safeguard and protect the Islam that he gave you. We are at a crossroads. We're watching all of the signs of the hour in real time. These are not YouTube flashbacks. This is stuff that's actually happening right now. And this stuff is happening due to the sins of the believers. The sins of the Muslims. These are not attractions. 
These are not things to look at and glorify. These are things to look at and be fearful. And I say this reason why I'm on this tour is because I look at the youth. Y'all the future of this ummah. Y'all are the future of this ummah. If you know anything about the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The youth from amongst the first generation of Muslims was appointed as governors of whole countries. Some of them even led war expeditions. So when you look at yourself as a Muslim, young, you're going to be questioned about your, your, your youth and how you spent it. It should be a single Muslim that ever succumbs to boredom. You can never be bored. You always got something to do. You can never be bored. Because boredom leads to curiosity. Curiosity leads to all kinds of things that, you know, consequences come with that many of us are not really ready to face. Your brother Amir just spent nine years in federal prison on trumped up charges, conspiracy put in place, Basically to stop me from doing what I'm doing right now. I've been home two and a half years. And I refuse to stop. Because although Allah forgave me for my previous career. I still feel a certain sense of responsibility because of the contribution that I made. The contribution that I made. To a culture that's corrupting not just the Muslim youth but the youth in general. Everyone is losing their babies. Everyone is losing their babies. It's not just the Muslims. But the reason why I take this time to speak to the Muslims because the Muslims, y'all know better. So if you know better, do better. Don't blame the world. Don't try to blame your parents. Because you're going to have to stand before your Lord alone. If there's anything that I said today is of any benefit, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And if there's anything that I said that's incorrect, it's from myself, my lack of knowledge, my deficiencies of a human, as a human being, and the whispers of the shaitan wa iyadu billah. Subhanakallahi wa bahamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Barakallahu feekum. وجزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته What time are we praying Isha inshallah 20 minutes Oh that's a good enough time I, I know we wanted to do a Q&A But I got something a little bit more interesting A whole lot interesting Y'all might have caught wind of this So hopefully some of y'all are prepared but as Muslims who ascribe ourselves to the Sunnah, we call ourselves Sunni Muslims. This is not something that's hand down. It's not something that's inherited. This ascription comes with knowledge. It comes with knowledge and understanding of the people who conveyed this religion to us. The people who sacrificed their lives so that we can walk around this earth and call ourselves Muslims. That's how serious it is to call oneself a person of the Sunnah. Understand that? So based on that, I'm going to go around the room and we're going to name 10 companions. But we're going to take away the four rightly guided khulifa. Because that's too easy. That's bedtime stories for a lot of y'all. And we're going to take away the mubashir ashra. You can't have the 10 that was promised paradise. That's a little too easy too. Like you're thinking like I can't, I ain't got all ten. Like you know, I understand. That's why I do it because the reaction is like it becomes heavy. Like ten minus them, right? But the reality of it is, we gonna work together as an ummah, right? Because that's how we should always do. So each individual is gonna give me one until we get the ten. That's better. You a little bit more relaxed now? Okay. Because he's about to come out of his jacket and everything. It got hot, right? Alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, 
We're going to start with you. MashaAllah. Y'all heard him? MashaAllah. He tried to hide behind his elbow. He like, you know. Give me a sahabi hat. I don't understand why y'all men think you can't name a female companion. It's just... MashaAllah. MashaAllah. I'm going to come back to you. You know. You know. MashaAllah. So Hassan. Ibn Abi Talib. Right? Son of Ali. MashaAllah. Tell me something about Hassan. <coughs> Anything. These are virtuous people. Grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Yeah. Anything we mention about them is, is like, you ain't got to, you know, don't, you got to search around. This is the beauty of the companions. Anything that you mention is praiseworthy, right? Somebody give me the first Muwaddin, brother here. Yeah, whatever's on your mustache is gone. You was picking it. It's, it's, it's gone. It ain't there no more. <laughs> That's what he said. Oh, Zayden had Okay, Zayden and Thabit. Mashallah. Okay. Sure you can. You got it. Name one of the wives of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There you go. Come on, brother. I ain't gonna let you get away like that. Khadijah, she was the first believer, right? Alhamdulillah. It don't matter. Somebody on the wall, cause the wall, you know, is where the cool people hang out. Everybody that's up on the wall, that's where the cool people hang out. I need, I need an answer from the cool side. Abu Sa Abu Sa Al Khudri, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Benefit us. Tell us something about Abu Sa'id. <laughs> no. No. There you go. There we go. <coughs> Who recorded the most hadith from the companions? Oh. Oh. Y'all was fast, loud, and wrong. <laughs> Who's the first? He only spent four years with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he narrated the most hadith. Abu Huraira. Who said that? Abu Huraira. 5,374 hadith. In, in a short period of time. And you can learn a lot from Abu Huraira. Because out of that four years, most of the narration that reached us, the example is the companions that you choose. You understand? He was around the best companion, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's something that we take away. Choose your companions wisely. It is not that difficult because Islam will choose your companions for you. Trust me. If you practice Islam, people will either be drawn to you or they're going to get away from you. You don't have to bust your brain trying to figure out who cool. Just stick to your Islam. People are going to either be inclined to you or they won't. It's not trivial, right? Somebody tell me who the first Muwaddin. The first Muwaddin. The first to call the Adhan. But I don't know about <coughs> who could tell me who the second? Mashallah. That's why y'all gotta respect your elders. He just bailed all y'all out because y'all was sitting around like I didn't even know it was a second. Alhamdulillah. One of y'all two. Y'all the coolest in the room. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma barak alayhuma. Khalid ibn Walid, see? I knew I knew they were gonna come with a warrior. I was looking over there like he gonna come up with a warrior's name. Khalid ibn Walid. Now your companion, he has to tell me what's what was the kunya, the nickname of Khalid ibn Walid. Let them them help his friend. The sword of Allah. Listen, there's no such thing as cheating in Islam. 
unless you Google. If you Google, then I, I, I you know, you don't lose points. We're not Googling, you know. You can ask your companion, your brother. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to do. You understand? Because sometimes we don't advise one another based on our own shortcomings, right? We feel like I can't advise you because I'm not doing the right thing. Lay a Jews. That's not, that's not good. You know, that's worse than a hypocrite, you know, because you become a silent devil. You actually watch your brother commit a sin and won't say nothing just because you're sinful. We all sinful. We all come up short, right? We all are work in progress. That's the beauty of Islam. Now, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell you how this little exercise and how it could be utilized. My favorite companion is Musab and Mulumaya. You know, I travel the world and make sure people know that. Because this particular companion, when I learned about him, it helped me navigate through one of the most difficult parts of me accepting Islam or coming to Islam. Because I had people that approached me, wanted to exploit me, wanted to take, you know, whatever they can and, you know, utilize my influence and so on and so forth. Not in malicious ways. Because sometimes the Muslims have good intentions, but they don't realize they're harming their brother. Like, for example, you know, I left the music business, right? Uh, brother Amir, you should do Islamic music. SubhanAllah, he only got one talent, that's it? That's how you see your brother? I've entertained the non-Muslims all these years, and so now you want me to entertain you? But they don't realize, you know, the good intentions, it's almost like, look, you got something good. Put it to good use. I understand that, but that wasn't for me. So anyway... Musab ibn Umayyah, he was the flower of Mecca. He was one of the flyest kids in Mecca. He was, he was from the youth, and he was, he was fly. Came from wealth, you know, spoiled. His sandals, the narrations that said his sandals was imported from Yemen. Right? Now, some of y'all get a little zealous because you got a car that's imported from Germany or a bag that just got shipped from Paris or something like that. Imagine almost 1,500 years ago, you live in Mecca and your sandals come from Yemen. You see what I'm getting? Ain't nothing flyer than that. So now when people used to approach me and say, yo, Brother Amir, you gave up all of this. You gave up the money. You gave up the cars. You gave up a lot of that, right? First thing come to my mind, Musab ibn Umayyah. And just the thought of him alone just humbles me. Because at that point, I look at a person and say, I didn't give up nothing compared to Musab ibn Umayyah. Anybody know how Musab ibn Umayyah died? Yeah. Yeah? Battle of Uhud. He didn't have the Exactly. When they went to collect his property, he only had a single cloth. You talking about he had everything anybody in Mecca would want. And for the sake of Allah, he gave all of that away. And when they went to collect his property, he had a piece of cloth that wasn't long enough to cover his body. They used to try to wrap his head to his feet and his feet would stick out. They tried to wrap his feet from his head and his head would stick out. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wept when Musa ibn Umayyah died. So this is also how you use or follow the sunnah, not only the Prophet Sallallahu but his companions. Because they're your companions. They are your role models. They are the best of the people. You understand? So when you're looking for a role model, don't look outside of Islam. You're only going to be misled. You're going to be disappointed. That those people have no virtue. None whatsoever. They just have things. Things that are insignificant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah calls them to account, they're not going to be able to bring it with them. Right? Egyptians tried. Right? Where they stuff at? Right in the museum. You can go see their stuff right now. Ain't nobody took nothing with them. Right? Pharaoh, nobody. All their stuff is right on display. You can go look at their stuff. They didn't take a single earring, a nose ring. Nothing went with them when they died. So, inshallah, 
I see some of y'all realize I'm a little rusty, right? I advise you as your brother, invest your time in learning about Hayat al-Sahaba, the life of the, the companions, the lifestyle of the companions. You will learn so much, you'll be so inspired, and you'll look at people who have no virtue and feel sorry for them. You understand? You don't look down on no one, but you'll look at these people and you'll feel sorry for them. Like, subhanAllah, how lowly you people are compared to these people here. These virtuous people who gave everything up for Allah. So, inshallah ta'ala, as a reminder to myself and a reminder to you all, you know, while we have time in this worldly life, To the best of your ability. Without being selfish. Give it to Allah. Allah will replace it with something better. We replace it with something better. I'm proof. Everything I gave away Allah replaced. I've been in more countries as a Muslim than I did as a, as a musician. And I've been to a lot of countries. As an artist. I've been to places I never thought I'd go. As a Muslim. You know. The money that I had before. Is not even necessary right now. Because I don't have no high expenditures. I don't buy Rolexes and stuff no more. So what Allah provides for me is enough. It's enough. This throw cost me nothing. Compared to things I used to wear. You understand? We trying to go to the party that don't stop. I've been to all the other ones for you. I promise you. They ain't worth it. I'm trying to go to the one that don't stop. And inshallah, by Allah's mercy and his permission, I meet all y'all there. Jazakallah khair. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi Or the companions of the Prophet which is what you're alluding to. Amazing role models. But do we know them? So inshallah on Thursdays, we have a whole session which is just about the companions and the Seerah of Rasulullah. And moreover, 
you. See what you want to do. There you go. Come forward. There you go. That part right Let's there. Help each other to put that through. As long as it complies <coughs> with Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala us <coughs> So just remember, this is your place. You need to come and as they say, many hands make light work. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and your family and may He cover us all with Afia. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Amen. Keep us among those who is I mean, I mean. No, alhamdulillah. Okay, brothers and sisters, it's like to take quick selfies with the youngsters and then the elders for the music Facebook and the speakers, you know, they have to be. The food is ready, so they need to go, but five minutes just for the pictures. Come on, youngsters. Come on, come on youngsters. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, youngsters. 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 Come on, Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.